about now is when she was a member of parliament, because in 1940, when she got elected, she was the first woman in the West Indies ever to become a member of parliament. And Dominica has always led in this regard with women. First Minister of Government uh, for the Federation was Phyllis Shand Alfrey. First woman Minister in local government, Mabel Moyer James. First Prime Minister, Mary Eugenia Charles. And uh, one of the first speakers, Mary Davis Peer. So women have always been kind of in the lead in, in Dominica. But I'll read about the Transinsular Road. When next you drive to the airport or have to go north to Marigot, just think of how this came about. In 1947, almost all of my former constituents signed a petition asking me to come back to them to represent them again in the Legislative Council. This I agreed to do. A gentleman in Calabishi congratulated me on my faith and gravity and the West Indian Times referred to the good works and human exhibits displayed by Mrs. Napier and her late husband. Hitherto, as a member of the Legislative Council, I had not been paid, but now I found myself in receipt of 100 pounds a year, which my colleagues had voted themselves in my absence. Two years later, there was another increase. <clears throat> I must pay a man to carry my basket, piped my neighbor. I must give a friend a little cigarette. Again in 1951, there were elections for the first time under adult suffrage. But I had already told my people that on the brink of 60, I could no longer face those long journeys on foot or by horse to the Windward Coast. Then the government once more offered me a nominated seat, and this time I accepted. So from 1951 for yet another three years, I sat at the Blue Bay's table, marveling that nominated members should be paid the same salary as those with a constituency to look after. It was all so easy. With the stream of visitors stayed, the voluminous correspondence abated. No longer did I have to pay a man to carry my basket, nor reward a friend with a little cigarette. It was while I was a nominated member that we fought the battle of the Transinsular Road. I suppose from the first day the first motor car was imported, there had been talk of making a highway through the mountains. In 1700, Pierre Labar had written, we walked right across the island to the windward coast, seeing, some, some, seeing nothing more interesting than trees. But Dominica then was still two islands and not one. From time immemorial, the Caribs had used a trail across the watershed between Pegua and Laio Valleys. The French wound their pave around it, making the grade easier. At a lower level, there was an English trace. Lennox and I had walked the Carib Trail when it was still blocked by huge victims of the 1930 hurricane, when Pierre Labat's trees had been flung about like matchsticks. We found that in order to surmount the vast trunks, travelers had cutlass footholds in the fallen timbers to make ladders. In 1944, our Development and Welfare Department, in answer to our Im importunities, authorized the completion of the road from the southern end. The main camp, christened Norway by men who found it so cold to work there, was half a mile further on. From all over the island, men had gathered to work on the road. Some had walked 16 miles from Roseau, and some had begged lifts from lorries, swinging the zigzag track that ends in the hard pan country, the Te Fem, where nothing can grow but only fantastic trees, so burdened with parasites that it is hard to know where the branches begin and the epiphytes end. On this section of the road, early in the 20th century, several English families had settled. Now one may search in vain for the foundations of their houses. Here and there a red hibiscus has survived, or a vivid cassia. Men crowded into the camp asking for a job, carrying sacks or baskets containing a week's food. One said to me, look how the lorry mash up my tin, showing me a piece of crushed metal that had once contained four gallons of kerosene. Now I have nothing left in which to cook my little provision. The overseer asked him, you want a job? You have tools? There was not enough tools in the island for so many. No bulldozers, no shovels. 
a road that elsewhere or in other times would have been driven through by adepts with engines, was given to inexperienced persons armed with toothpicks. Men excavated stumps and boulders by pickaxe. Women headed away earth on wooden trays, barefooted, carrying soil from one hole to put into another. A few months afterwards, it was announced that there was no more money. The whole 50,000 pound grant had drained away. Some said that the laborers had killed their own golden goose by working too slowly. But there was also woeful talk of feathered nests and of willful, profitable to someone waste. The next engineer said, we can't let this stand as a monument to British inefficiency. Just as 